I've told this story before, but I'll tell it again because it's so appropriate, really, for this message. Spirit, lead me. That's the name of this message. I want to tell this story. People that have been in this church any time at all know that I love to hunt. I love to be out in the woods. And you probably know this, but if you don't, I want to tell you that you don't spend all your time harvesting an animal. Most of what you do is just sit in the woods, which I love. Gives me a lot of peace of mind, and so I love to go hunting, and so do Patty's relatives. Her sister's killed bigger bucks than I have. I mean, she's, she's a crack shot. I mean, she's awesome. The whole family hunts down in Savannah, Georgia. Well, I, I hunt, not Patty, but the rest of them. Patty said, I'm going to leave that up to you, okay? I hunt up here. I hunt in a tree stand. I sit a lot. Down there, when I wanted to go hunting with them, they would hunt with dogs. And so they release these dogs, they call them, count, they call them county dogs, because they'll run the deer into the next county. They're beagles, you know, those types of dogs, blue ticks. They'll just run and run and run and run. And so they invited me to go hunting with them in the Georgia woods. It wasn't the type of hunting I was used to, but it's hunting, right? So I'm going to go. Let's go. So we drive out to the property. They have this leased property, tons of wood, swamp, everything. And they make a game plan together, and they give me to this guy. His nickname was Preacher. And I should have known right away that this was not going to be a good thing. So I walk out on this gas line, which is not a path. It's literally two people wide, a mile into the pitch black. Literally, it's as wide as this center aisle. A little less, actually. In the pitch black, walking out for a mile, and preacher takes me out there and he says, listen, turn to the right, go 200 yards, and when you see a pond, you run into a pond, sit next to the pond. It's pitch black. I'm walking in the dark, have no idea, I've never been in this woods before, I can't hear anything, there's no traffic, we are way out. I walk about 200 yards, wander around like a lost sheep, no pond. So finally, I just sit down. I actually climbed up into a tree and sat on a branch, like some kind of hermit or something. Like I'm up in this branch, and the dogs are running around, and they're going crazy, and they're barking, and I could hear them coming to me, but they never really came to me. I never got a bead on the dogs nor the deer. And after about three hours, I said to myself, I'm, gonna, I'm tired of sitting on this branch. It's not very comfortable. I'm going to walk back to the gas line. Never found it. I've been lost twice, once up here and once in Georgia. Yes, it's true. And I walked for hours through unimaginable swamp, briars. They had just been talking about how there was poisonous critters, rattlesnakes and water moccasins all over the property. I'd walk towards the dogs barking, trying to find a place where they may be, and I just went deeper into the swamp. There was a few times that I literally had to get on my hands and knees to get through the vegetation. Briars are tearing at my face, my clothes getting ripped up. It gets warm at Savannah, so it's getting up almost to 80. I'm shedding all the camo that I borrowed from my family. It's out in the woods still. I'm throwing it off. I'm walking through the woods. I'm firing my gun, hoping somebody will hear the bullets. And I'm thinking, here's my last bullet. After being in the woods for five hours, walking constantly for five hours on the brink of exhaustion, even though I was much younger, shooting my gun, trying to get someone to know where I was at so they could come in and get me because I had no clue. But I didn't know what it was like out there. I didn't know if it was 20 miles to the next road. I didn't know if there was an impenetrable swamp right in front of me. It was tough. I was thinking to myself, I'm going to spend a night out here. And if you don't know if Georgia hunting, one of the biggest things you have to worry about, obviously, is rattlesnakes and water moccasins, but it's also the wild hog. So I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to find me a tree that's laying down, and I'm going to climb halfway up and try not to fall out of the tree and go to sleep if I have to spend the night. I started praying, started to panic just a little bit, y'all. Not scared of the woods. I've walked out in the pitch black before, but I, I don't want to be out here at night. How many of you all can understand that? I just don't want to be out there. And so I've been walking for hours. I'm exhausted. 
I took all my camo off. I'm walking around with this gun. I'm just thinking I'm going to spend the night. I was praying. I said, God, please, please help me find my way out of here. I have no idea how big this piece of woods is. And so I'm praying, and all of a sudden I just stopped. I just stopped in my tracks. I just got done praying. I turned around and I looked at the, at the ground, at the geography, and I could tell that there was a different vegetation growing in this direction. Just boom, just stopped, saw this. And it looked like higher ground. And let me just tell you something. There's not a lot of higher ground in Savannah, Georgia. If it rises at all, it's a miracle because it's all lowlands, especially there in Savannah. So I start walking up that way. And within five minutes, Patty's Uncle Gary comes driving in on a truck in a truck and bumps into me. I'll tell you, I believe that was the Spirit of God. It just stopped me dead in my tracks. I looked and I noticed. My mind told me, the vegetation's different that way. Let's go that way. And literally, he drove in with his truck five minutes later and bumped right into me. And he said in his southern accent, he said, Chad, I'm not, I wasn't coming out of here and telling Patty you were lost in the woods without you. I was going to find you. <laughs> Even though we may not be that desperate in our everyday life, folks, more than ever before, we need the Holy Spirit to guide us. Christians, and this is a Pentecostal church, we talked about the power of God last week. We need to be led by the Spirit of God more than ever. Way beyond your capacity to navigate your own life. Way beyond, men, your intellect or your logic. There's a deeper reasoning. There's a deeper perception inside of you. It is the perception of the Holy Spirit leading your life. Supernatural leading that the Holy Spirit wants to do in your life every minute of every day who wants to be led by the Spirit of God this morning? I do. I do. So Romans chapter 8 and verse 14 talks about being led by the Spirit of God. Go ahead and take it down. Sing a song while you're up there. No, you're fine. I know. I knew that. It's okay. You really can't distract me. All right, Romans eight fourteen. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. If you claim Christ, if you're a son or daughter of God, your calling card, now that you've been born again, is that you should be led by the Spirit. Hear me. It's not just being ethical or moral or being a well-behaved person or being religious in a good way. Are you spiritual? Are you spiritual? Because the only way you overcome in this life, the only way that you can be led by God is if you are a spiritual person. You may be morally astute. You may do the right things. No one in church could ever call you into account and say that you do bad things or wrong things. You may be moral. You may be religious. But are you spiritual? It's the X factor in the world today. We house the Holy Spirit. It is the difference between us and other religions. We house the third person of the Trinity. Amen? Who still wants to be led by the Spirit? Come on, wave at me. So I don't want to assume that people understand even what I'm talking about. Jesus said in John chapter 3 that you must be born again. Only those that are born again of the Spirit can inherit the kingdom of God. If you know Christ and that Spirit lives in you, you're a new creation, and that Holy Spirit wants to lead you and guide you and direct you every day. Because I don't want to assume that people know what I'm talking about, I want to talk about the makeup of a human being. We're created in the image of God, the book of Genesis says to us. Amen? We are spirit, soul, and body. Okay? Everybody touch yourself somewhere. That's your body. Everybody passes the first test, amen? Some people are like touching somebody else or touching the chair. That's your body. Everybody understand that you have a body, amen? Your soul is your will, your mind, and your emotions. 
The decision-making center of you, your willpower, that is your soul. Your emotions are your soul. Your mind is your soul. The Bible tells us that we need to renew our mind, that we need to work out our salvation with fear and trembling at the, for the salvation of our soul. You know, we got to correct a lot of stinking thinking after we become born again. The Bible's true when it says, hey, you're born again. It means that you have to learn how to sit up, how to crawl, how to walk in the spirit. You're going to have to learn how to live life all over again. You're not just quitting some things that you used to do. You're going to navigate your entire life differently from this moment. And so you've got to renew your mind to line up to your born-again spirit, who's like a beacon from heaven leading you down the road that God wants you to be led. So you have a body, you have a soul, mind, will, and emotions, and the deepest part of you is that born-again spirit. And the Bible says that that spirit man was dead before you were born again. It had no inclination or ability to lead you anywhere except into sin. Now, just like I've said the last couple of weeks, and I'll speak of myself, this old Pinto body, right? Pinto is a car, if you don't know, an old car that used to blow up when you hit the back of it. God has dropped a Lamborghini engine inside of this flesh. And it runs according to different rules, and it has power and authority. Amen? It's not a new idea that we have renewable energy. The Bible says that our spirit man is renewed day by day. Amen? Renewable energy, imperishable, incorruptible inside of us. That is the down payment against our final salvation in heaven. It is the thing that's pulling us towards righteousness. It's pulling us towards heaven. It's pulling us towards intimacy with God. The born-again spirit inside of us, okay? So Proverbs 20, 27 talks about the innermost being, the spirit man. Verse 27, the spirit of a man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all the inmost parts of his being. There's a place inside of you that wants to talk to your inner you, the place that you hide from everybody else. God knows. He is the searchlight. Come on, somebody. And the word of God and the spirit can divide you down to the joint and marrow of who you are, cut you down right to the center of who you are and speak to the deepest part of you, all right? So the spirit is the innermost being, John 7. John 7 and verse 37, we see this again in the New Testament. Now in the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone is thirsty, let him come and drink. Man, that's some good news right there, folks. I don't know about y'all. I don't need the spirits of this world. I'm drinking from the heavenly fountain that's birthed inside of me that Jesus talked about in John chapter 4. And I'm telling you, I'm satisfied because of that fountain that I drink from. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. By, but this, he spoke of the spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive, for the Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not glorified. You know, people these days talk about a rhythm of life. Get in a rhythm, in the timing of a healthy lifestyle with a Sabbath and work and leisure and play. I'll tell you what, that's valuable, but I want to get in the flow of the river of God. There's something inside of me that is leading me to heaven and to righteousness. I just want to get in the lazy river, in a sense, of God and get on my inner tube and float and just absolutely live in the peace of God and the power and enablement of God. I want to get in the lazy river of, of the peace of God and flow with Him. Do you know what it is to live in the flow and the current of the Spirit of God in your life? That is a place of power. It's a place of peace. Jesus said that there was a river inside of us that would flow up to eternal life. I don't want to just have a good rhythm in life and have good rest time and do these practical things. I want to get in the river of God and flow with him every moment. That's what it means to be led by the Spirit of God. Do you understand the currents, the ebb and the flow 
of the Spirit of God in your life. Get in the river. Get in the river. The Bible says in the book of Ephesians, don't get drunk with wine. Don't let it hit you. But be filled with the Spirit. Some of y'all drink to loosen up. Come into the life of the Holy Ghost. I'm going to show you what loose is. I'll be so loose, I'll embarrass you. I don't care anymore. I got peace like a river flowing in my soul. We're captured and enraptured by the Spirit that envelops us. And I can just tell you, I'm not afraid of anybody. I'm not afraid of devils. I'm not afraid of Satan or demons. And I'll tell you what, if I get any more loose or free, I'm just going to embarrass everybody because I am free. And the freedom that the Spirit gives you is freedom indeed. You don't need to sip on the world's spirits to get loose. I'm telling you, get in this house. Get full of the Spirit. Drink heavily of the Spirit of God and the river of God and see what He will do. I ain't got no hangover. I don't get no headache. I don't get nauseous in the morning. I wake up and His mercies and His grace are just as new as they were the morning before. I don't need it. I don't, it's not a crutch. I don't, I don't need it to help me loosen up and get to know people. I'm telling you, the Holy Ghost can do that for you. Woo! I want to be led in a different way. Amen? New American Standard Bible. Romans 8, 16. But the Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God. I like the New King James. This is what it says. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. You've heard it in Pentecostal charismatic circles. If you've been a part of life in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. You know, to a certain degree... That is true. But I can tell you, once the Holy Spirit has taken your life over and you abide in Christ and He abides in you, the Holy Spirit's operation in your life isn't so subtle. You just can't choose sin and not feel the breaking of the intimacy. It's not as subtle as you think. We walk around, it's like, oh, we're so deaf to it that we walk around under our own devices and our own inclinations and we don't sense the Spirit. And I'm just going to tell you, if you can do this, that, and the other in your life, you can speak this way, be rude to people, cuss people out, yell at people. I'm just going to tell you, the Holy Ghost does not have enough of a hold of you. And I'm telling you, He's a gentleman until He takes over your life. Then all of a sudden, you feel the fracture. You feel the breaking of breaking His heart when you do anything that breaks that communion and that oneness. And it's not so gentlemanly. If you lived in complete dependence to the Holy Spirit of God, when you hurt His heart, you're going to know the minute you do it. Patty and I have been living together for a long, long time. And I know you may find this hard to believe, but I still put my foot in my mouth all the time. And it's funny how communication works in a marriage. You don't have to say a word. We're, we're on the other side of the room. My big mouth, everybody hears every word I say, no matter what room I'm in. All of a sudden, I take my size 10. Put it right in my mouth. And Patty's on the other side of the room, looking in another direction, talking to somebody, and I can feel it. No, 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 no. Stupidest thing you've ever said. No, 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 no. What's going on? Can't rein in his tongue. Can I tell you the Holy Spirit wants to stand up in the courtroom of your life and testify about what you should do? David said this. I've looked into the commandments and they're exceedingly broad. Enlarging my heart to run the race of your commands. Look. If you live in communion with the Holy Spirit, it will take you so far beyond the Ten Commandments, you won't be able to hang out with people that you used to hang out with. There's no law, I can't hang out with Sally. All of a sudden, the Holy Spirit's directing your life and saying, I can't hang out with 
you won't be able to say the stuff that you used to say without grieving the Holy Spirit of God. You think the Ten Commandments, oh, I'm just going to do everything that the Ten Commandments says that I, you know, says that I can't do. I'm going to do all, or doesn't speak to. I'm going to do all those things. No, when you live in communion with the Holy Spirit, He's going to be Lord over your life. He's going to direct you and every step that you have. You don't want to break communion. You don't want to break oneness. He's going to stand up in the courtroom of your life and bear witness to what you should do. It's going to take you so much farther than you are in your church life. A lot of stuff you'll never speak out loud to the convictions that you hold, that the Holy Spirit spoke to you in secret. This is intimacy with God. Some of us live our lives like the semi-driver that was training to be a semi-driver, professional CDL driver. He took his semi up this mountain pass and was dragging the back end of it over the cliff. I mean, this guy can maneuver this semi like nobody else. He was going up all the switchbacks. And I mean, he's just peeling out, taking the back end of the truck over the, over the rails, taking it over the cliff. We think sometimes that our Christian life is to be lived that way. I know what liberties I have. I know what freedom I have. Listen, there's nothing more free than following the Holy Spirit in deep, deep intimacy I don't want what this world wants. I don't want to talk. I don't want to look like. I don't want to be anything like them. I want to be like Jesus. And that's where true freedom is. Some of you all live your Christian life like that semi-driver that's training for his CDL. Look at how close I can get to the edges. I'll do all this stuff. I can maneuver my Christian life and everybody will think I'm just something special. Can I tell you? Why not stay close? It might sound boring to you, but it doesn't matter what you think. We're in this for freedom. I want to stand close to the rock wall. I want to build this house on the rock. I'm going to be safe. I'm going to do it right. And I'm going to let him show me what freedom is. The Holy Spirit wants to stand up inside of your conscience and maybe not be so much of a gentleman as you think and bear witness and testify of the way that you should walk. How many of y'all have ever gotten a new car? Woohoo! Yes. How many of y'all like the new smell? Yes, I love the new smell. Doesn't last long, but especially after basketball. Whenever you jump into that new car, it's like the brakes are tighter than the other car I just had. Steering's a little bit different. Turns a little sharper. Responds a little better. The bucket seat, like I think I'm, I feel like I'm sitting on the road. Like, we have to adjust how we react. And we've gotten so used to driving that literally we can almost do it subconsciously, right? But when we get in a new car, we got to learn the controls. God is inviting you into a new way of living. Men, a lot of us, it's not suicide, intellectual suicide, It's not you aborting the logic that God gave you, but there's a deeper place that you can be led from. I'm just telling you right now. Women more naturally are intuitive to the nuances of life and relationships, so they got a little bit of a head start on us, but I'm just going to tell you right now, I'm going to try to excel as a man. I'm not going to rely on my logic or my own thinking. I understand that there's a new perceiver inside of me. It's the new creation, and I want to be led by the Spirit. Amen. Woohoo. <laughs> it takes listening. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Right? Jesus said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Right? It takes listening on a different level, not just with your ears, not just hearing audible English language like you're hearing this morning. It takes a different level of listening from here. Some of you guys are so logically based, it's going to be a little bit of a tough road for you to understand that God is speaking to you from your inmost being, your innermost being. Hebrews 3, 7. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Wouldn't it be amazing, y'all, if our relationship, the sum total of our relationship with God would not be the outward projection of things that we do and don't do, but it literally was our heart. And you would think that you're backsliding and not good with God the minute your heart got hard, because that is exactly the truth. 
You may never do anything that gets you on the nightly news. Thank God, right? But when it comes to our relationship with God and our oneness with the Holy Spirit, all you have to do is harden your heart. And I can tell real quick by what comes out of people's mouths if they got a hard heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Jesus said this, by every idle word you'll be judged. Boy, I don't want to be that person. I don't want to have a hard heart. Revelation 2.7. He who has ear, has, has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life. Which is in the paradise of God. Again, there's a difference between being moral, being ethical. A lot of times we get into this stuff and we kind of pin a badge on ourselves because we're not like other people. I don't do the things that other people do. Look what they're doing. Look what they're doing. They did this to me. And we get this kind of moral arrogance, pride. Folks, it's more than being ethical, moral, or religious. Are you spiritual? Are you spiritual? Can you listen for that still, small voice? When I became the pastor of this church, y'all, I mean, I know that God had called me and I'd been in the ministry for years, but I was like this. <laughs> Even though I kind of knew what it would take to pastor a church, I saw it secondhand. I served the man of God. I served my pastors throughout my life. When I stepped into that office, I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. God, help this church. Help me. Help Patty. She has to get a front row seat to me trying to figure out what it means to pastor a church. If you don't think there's a big difference between those jobs, let me just tell you, a lot different. So I was like this. And the only thing that I knew to do was to listen to God. And I took steps in secret where nobody else knew. And I found out the wisdom of those steps a lot later. I only listened to the Holy Spirit. I said, God, here I am. I don't know what I'm doing. You called me. What do you want me to do next? I didn't get up on a billboard. I'm saying it this morning. I'm telling you publicly. I didn't flash it on the sign. Pastor Chad heard this from God. Therefore, we all got to do it. No, it was in secret, small steps that you need to be obedient in so that he can lead you to bigger things. I didn't know what God was leading me in at that moment, but I see the wisdom in it today. Can you trust the Holy Spirit inside of you? Can you? You trust God when you get in trouble, when you have a sickness that the doctors can't cure. Can you trust God right now with your life for guiding you every step? So many times we're left to our own devices and God wants to lead us in a wholly different way, in a deeper way. Who's ready to be led by the Spirit? Come on, we gotta listen. We gotta listen like never before. God doesn't speak on our timetable. So if you ask him something, this is just a little nugget, a word of advice. If you ask him something, you gotta keep it on the front burner of your mind and you have to expect an answer. And here's what I would encourage you to do. Just like Mary said to those people that were at the wedding where Jesus turned the water into wine, whatever he says to you, do it. If you don't think it relates to the thing that you're praying about, it doesn't matter. He knows how it all connects. He knows how it's connected. Whatever he says to you in secret, whatever he whispers when you're listening, do it. Do it. Because if you're faithful in a little, he'll give you a lot more. He'll give you a lot more. We've got to learn how to listen. Amen? So if you have your Bible, turn to Romans chapter 8. This speaks of the intentionality that we need, the posture that we need to be children of the Spirit. Romans chapter 8 and verse 6. For the mindset on the Spirit, or on the flesh, is death. But the mindset on the Spirit is life and Peace. Two different lanes that we can live in. And if you're born again, you can live in the flesh lane all day long. And if you're a good person, no one will even ask you if you're doing okay. This is really the deception of religion. Like we can fall into that lane of the flesh 
operating out of the carnal mind, you know, keep our finances right, keep our yard trimmed, you know, pay our bills, and not be any more spiritual than a man on the moon. Y'all realize that a lot of religious people haven't been full of, full of the Spirit for ages, and no one could call them into account. So this is really easy for us to deceive ourselves and hoodwink ourselves. We can be in the lane of the flesh, and all that it's going to bring into our life is death. Death, death, death. Here's a key. When you're being led by the Spirit, you're going to understand that the choices that you make are actually bringing life and peace. Right? Not death. Some of y'all have been beating, up your, beating your head against the wall for years over certain things, and it's not what you're doing, it's how you're doing it. And the Spirit of God wants to speak to you about how you're doing it. For instance, lying. Some of y'all got really adept at sidestepping issues. You can answer without answering. When you get that good at lying, you have to be careful. Because you will lie to yourself. Right? How many of y'all love the truth and you love to hear the truth? I'm telling you the truth right now. And even though we don't know this, even the most honest person lies to themselves on some level. Our conscience, bearing witness with, with the Spirit, sometimes excuses us or condemns us. That's what our conscience does. I'm talking about a higher level of being led than your conscience. Some of you have a sensitive conscience. It's not enough. There's a person that's living inside of you, the Holy Spirit. He knows better. I know people that have a hyperactive conscience and they'll never do anything bad. If they ever did anything wrong, they'd feel so terrible about it. Terrible about it. That's not a high enough leading. That's not a high enough navigation system. You have to intentionally say, I'm going to live according to the Spirit. Some of you have been born again for years and you don't live this way yet. You're not in this lane. You're in this lane. The lane of the Spirit that brings life and peace. Now, I've used this analogy before, and I'll use it again. I need these things in my life. They're called rumble strips on the road. When you get close enough to God, and the Spirit has a hold of you enough, you're not worried about what other people are doing. You just want to make sure you don't get outside that lane and you hear that rumble strip. Bup, 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 bup. No, Jesus, I've been down that road. I'm going to stay in this lane. I'm not going to allow myself to get outside. You have to know it that well. You've got to be intimately tied to it that much where literally everything you do is led by the Spirit. Led by the Spirit. Remember, Jesus said this, Abide in me and let me abide in you, for apart from me you can do nothing. A lot of religious people have built kingdoms with no spirit power. I don't want to be the person that people look at and say, oh, wow, he's religious. No, I want to live in the power of the Spirit, and then I'll let the cards fall where they may. I want to follow Jesus. I want to be in the lane of life and peace, and I don't want to be out for one minute. I don't want to be out at all. I don't want to break fellowship. I don't want to break communion with my wife for even five seconds. I don't want to, if it's true with my earthly relationship, it's true with God. Have you grown in intimacy with God and oneness with God? Like it, nothing can fracture. You don't want anything to break the oneness. You want to be led. You want to live and move and have your being in him. As one, you do what you do. As one, you say what you say. As one, you follow him. I'm talking about a deeper level than religion could ever take you. Again, it goes way beyond the Ten Commandments. I'm almost done. It'll take you to the place where you won't be able to get too far into anything because anything can become an idol. Your ministry, your gift, your calling, your success, your job, your lawn, your house, like sports, leisure, the Holy Spirit won't let you get too far into anything. If there's one thing that I've struggled with is I, I get passionate about the simplest things, the grass growing. I was <laughs> like five times I said, Patty, doesn't the grass look great? She's like, Chad, please, like, it looks great. We already talked about this like five minutes ago. 
Come on, guys. It's a guy thing, right? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, thank you, guys. Doesn't mean it's right, but I tend to throw myself into stuff wholeheartedly. And God has had to rein me in so many times. It's like, you want to hunt that much, but you can't. You want to do this, that. You, you can't. It's so far beyond the Ten Commandments. It's called relationship. You could give me the ten rules of marriage relationship. Look, I've gone so far beyond those rules till I love this woman and allow her to love me. Look, is your relationship with Jesus like that? Like, you've left the commandments. They're almost invisible to you now. It is about your relationship. You would never go back and do that stuff. You want to go further. You want to toss yourself in so deep that you understand God's heart in every moment. When you drift, ding, 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 ding. There it is. The spirit standing up in the courtroom in my life, you're drifting, you're not focused. You're hardening your heart. You're hardening your heart. You didn't do anything wrong, but like you're, you're in a bad spot right this morning. Before 1030 this morning, you're, you better pray, brother. You ain't going to be in the spirit. You're going to be in the flesh. Like anybody else have that bell go off. When you lose focus, when you lose focus, man, the Holy Spirit's like, okay, where are you going today? I'm right here. But on the positive side of leading, I want you to go here and do this. I'm going to lead you here and you can do that. I can tell you supernaturally, I could tell you a thousand stories of how God led me into conversations, led me to somebody on the street, led me to counseling somebody like I could go there. God wants to speak on the positive side of the ledger and lead you and have you say stuff and all of a sudden your Jesus was skin on. You're literally representing Jesus in your personality to this person when the Spirit is just giving you words, leading you. He tells you to go here and do this or say that. He stirs up your compassion. Man, some of my favorite scriptures in all the Bible is when Jesus is looking over the crowd and something just comes up on the inside of him. They're like sheep without a shepherd. I got to give them what God wants to give them. Are you stirred in your compassion? That's the Holy Spirit working in your life. I believe this world could take bucket loads, truck loads of more compassion. Are you out there this morning? It can come from you. Even if you don't have the mercy gift like Tammy does. Listen, God wants to speak to you, use you. Stir up your compassion for people. Maybe the Holy Ghost could give you the words in the very moment that you need them. Yes, he can. I can't form my words. I'm not bold. I can't do this. Listen, I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit graces people in those moments supernaturally where the most meek and humble person can get up and say something about Jesus. I'm going to tell you, as you follow the Holy Spirit, there's going to be a time and a place where you're going to speak up. And you may not be on a stage. You may not be holding a mic, but you're going to be in that place where God wants to use you And he's going to help you say the things you need. He will give you the words in the moment. There's been some times, and listen, I talk for a living, but I couldn't construe, I couldn't manufacture this stuff. I couldn't construct it. I was out talking to people, maybe out in the streets, in Home Depot, like I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't plan it. There was no forethought. And I got into a conversation. All of a sudden, I realized, Holy Spirit is all over this conversation. I love to live like that. I love to live like that. This is the end of this message. How many of y'all remember, and for some of y'all, like, you never had this. So this is a little bit for the older folks, okay? How many of y'all used to buy the big old Atlas book? Big old, I I know, young people are like, what is that? And Mama used to be in the pastor's side. She'd open up the Atlas book and said, we're going to Georgia. And right now we need to be on Highway 81 going down the side of Pennsylvania. And then you got in the city. It's like you got to get off on this exit and that exit. And you got to do this, that, and the other. And like you had to have somebody telling you what to do. Right? Now all of you got, all you got is Lola. GPS talking to y'all. And some of y'all really, really get irritated by Lola because she's telling you what to do. But it, Right? 
How many of y'all got a different style voice kind of telling you, you change it from Lola, you couldn't take any more, you needed somebody else's voice? Wow, Holy Spirit helped them with patience. What did we do before we had modern GPS? Like, I know I got lost a lot. I used to call my wife Pocahontas because she has a lot of Indian blood inside of her. She would remember where we're at. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid to say this for all these men. She was way better. Like, where's the sun? Okay, we need to go that way. Like, I, I couldn't do that. I would try to pull the man thing, but I got over it real quick. Oh, I know where I'm going. Yeah, well, we got lost so many times. I was like, all right, I give up that ghost. Pocahontas, tell us where to go. Holy Spirit, Pocahontas, where are we supposed to be? And that survives until this day, okay? What do we do before we got GPS to tell us within three feet of where we're supposed to be? You know what? Your Christian life operating in the flesh is like getting out that old map book. Matter of fact, it's even worse than that. You're trying to find your way. You're trying to navigate your way through life with an old, rugged, worn-out map. And God's like, I want to give you a GPS. I'll keep you in the lane that brings life and peace. You just got to listen to my voice. You got to hear my promptings. You got to understand when I'm nudging you and I'm speaking to you, who wants to be led by the Spirit? Say amen. Come on, church, stand to your feet this morning.